Hey, what's going on guys? Big Ken here and I have a great guest for you today and we're going to talk about how Furiosa might just have been a complete wash, how the interview with the Vampire series might just be better than the original, and we're going to talk about some Sundance Film Festival movies and underrated gems that we were highly impressed with and so much more guys. So without further delay, let's give it up to D Movie Man so we can talk about it. All right, so D Movie Man, how about you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Yes, okay. So I am originally from uh, the home of the greatest family in music history, in my opinion. I think a lot of people might agree. But I'm originally from Gary, Indiana, um, slash Chicago, Illinois. And I say that because my um, residence was in Gary, Indiana, but then I went to school in Chicago, um, had family in Chicago, went to church in Chicago. Like It was like my whole life was in both cities, a lot of Indiana and a lot of Illinois. And, um, and just in coming up and having those experiences with family, with friends in my community, uh, films very quickly became a core part of my life. Now, I would say outside of that, books were really my main thing. I was known as the book reader because all I would do was just carry around <laughs> books. Um, I would go, anytime we would go to a store, my family members would talk about the fact that they would always end up buying me a bunch of books and they suddenly realized like we need to go to the library because like you're eating up a pockets this is a this is a problem and then um on and then outside of that films cuz i feel like books were kind of like my entertainment away from home because you know we don't we have all these devices now but back then you know if you watch something it's at home like if you watch a film or a movie it's either at home or at the theater so books were kind of like my entertainment and my experiences away from that and then whenever i got in front of the television screen or at the theater that was kind of like my big escapist experience and i think from from a very young age i felt like film in a lot of ways would sometimes parallel uh, my own life uh, in in a lot of ways. There were there was a sense of idealism and hope and happiness I had, and I felt like there were a lot of films, especially when it came to family, that I just saw myself reflected in, or characters mm -hmm. that enjoyed reading or enjoyed certain types of things that I connected to. Um, of course, films that were set in Chicago <laughs> or um, you know the Midwest that as well. And then I think the older I got, um, I also saw them as an escape, not always from life in a negative sense, but just this way to kind of open one's imagination and open up, you know, these parts of yourself creatively and just and just kind of reshape the way you see the world. And I think through that and then, of course, seeing and of course, this is also um Two people who held, uh, who were a part of the Chicago scene, but Siskel and Ebert, seeing the two thumbs up and all of that, it just it kind of became this much bigger thing. But I don't think I really understood the significance of film, of cinema, of that experience until I got much, much older. So that was kind of the beginning of it all. But I think once I got like significantly older is when it like hit a little bit differently for me. But that, as far as the initial, uh, the early years, that's that's kind of where I got my start. So what inspired you to actually create your own YouTube channel? Who, um, that was a long and arduous <laughs> experience because I think by the time I got into college, I feel like YouTube, well, I want to say maybe while, when I was in high school going into college, YouTube was... A thing, but the whole content creation, the the platforms, I don't think that was that was nowhere near, of course, what it is now. But even with the early YouTubers and the early ch uh, channels and things like that, all that hadn't happened. But I remember because I talked so much about movies and I would have movie nights with friends and I would show them trailers on my laptop and I just, you know, I had this, I was kind of the, the movie hub in a sense um, and just the conversations and kind of a little bit of a community I built. Because of that, they said, like, you should do YouTube, you should do YouTube. And there was a part of me that wanted to. I had already started uh, writing reviews uh, on my own little blog at that point, but I was scared to do YouTube for many reasons. One, back then, YouTube, you could not post a video longer than 15 minutes. And I and I said I significantly remember that, and I was like, one, I'm worried that I'm gonna talk way too much, and I won't be able to cap it. 
Um, two, I don't want to just sit there and talk the entire time on camera. I want to be able to use clips and trailers and I want to, you know, use footage to enhance this. And because there was so much discourse about copyright and fair use and what is and what's not, I was just like, I don't want to start this journey and then get my channel shut down because of trying to use content. And then the biggest thing, unfortunately, is just that I did not have the confidence. I just didn't believe that anyone would care to hear or see what I had to say. Even if it was, you know, good commentary, I'm just like, no one cares about this. And I just think that because, I think unconsciously, I chose to devote myself to doing things creatively for other people. So when other people would want to start a YouTube channel or wanted to do something with videography or photography, I would just devote myself to that because I think unconsciously it allowed me to kind of live through them and, and feel like, well, you know what? I'm devoting myself creatively to someone's vision, but it wasn't my vision, which was a good and bad thing. It was good because I enjoyed helping people out in that way, but it just, it kept me from pushing forward in that lane. So it really, it really wasn't until 2020. Um, and that, and that's way after um, I, you know, graduated from college and all of that. But it really didn't. It really wasn't until 2020, which of course was in the midst of the Ponderosa, that's what I call it, um, and all <laughs> and lockdown and all that happened. That I was just kind of like, mm, I don't really have any excuses anymore. I just felt like it was a transitional period. I felt like, I don't know, just where life was at that point also, for a lot of different reasons, I just felt like I can't keep myself from doing this anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, I'm someone who can really just come up with a lot of ways, or I just, I can always convince, you know, talk myself out of something. So it was finally my opportunity. And so what I did was I remember seeing something on Facebook and I feel like it's one of those like posts that always float around social media and you always see at some point or another. But it said, um, take the next six months and uh, whatever goal you have in mind, whatever aspiration, devote your time to that for the next six months. Don't tell anybody about it. Don't speak about it. Don't put anything out. Just work on it. Work, 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 work. Um, and to really devote yourself to that goal and at the end of those six months, see where you are and, you know, and then what comes out of it, you know, comes out of it. So I decided to start by doing recaps of Issa Rae's Insecure on HBO. And I didn't tell anybody about it because, and I'm glad I did it that way because part of it was the post, but part of it was also that I knew if I did it, with people knowing about it, I would get too in my head. And I would be mm -hmm. too conscious of the audience rather than just saying what I have to say and getting it out there. So, uh, yeah, so really, so 2020 is when it started and it took a lot of um, time and effort and energy and a lot of different things. But uh, I would say that was the start of it all. And it's been, yeah, so it's been like four years since then. And the first year was, like I said, a lot of that was transitional. So not to say the first year doesn't count, but it really wasn't official until like 2020, like the very beginning of 2021. I feel like when you get on the platform such as YouTube or IG or TikTok, there's this level of vulnerability that mm. you kind of have to allow yourself to have because you are essentially opening yourself up, your thoughts you know, what makes you tick and sharing that with the masses or, or putting it out there into the social media ether and you are opening yourself up for other people to take what you're saying, to hear what you think or what you thought right. and hopefully react to it positively mm -hmm. versus attacking or being yeah. negative to how you feel about a particular project. You know, you have to have this level of vulnerability, which I think it takes a special type of person mm -hmm. to do social media in the way that you are or that we are, right? You have to have some type of courage or bravery because you are opening yourself up to others and while that could be a beautiful thing because you can build relationships you can network with people i think it'd be an absolute beautiful thing that connection the safe space where you can share common interests but i also 
I think it can be very scary. But yeah, kudos to you to in getting started, man. That, that's awesome. Now that you've been doing it for a while, what would you say has been your greatest challenge? Ooh, I can think of a few. But I think my number one challenge has been trusting my own voice and my own ability mm. and my own presence. Mm and purpose on this platform. Uh, and the reason I say, and of course, we can all be our own worst enemy, but I right. think that because, and social media does not help us either, but I think because everything is so image-centered and platform-centered and brand-centered, it can make you question what you're doing if what you're doing doesn't look a certain way. So like mm. if my, you know, if my videos aren't like this, if I don't, uh, if my uh, energy isn't like this, if I don't do a whole bunch of like, there are so many ways that I can compare myself, of course, the, uh, you know, comparison is a thief of joy. We hear that all the time, but it's very yes. easy just to see yourself in comparison. Or even if you take away the comparisons, just how do I see myself and how do I understand my presence on this platform? And there are times where I question it. <laughs> There are times where I've second guessed it, although that has improved. I would say that's always going to be my number one challenge and just wondering if I, I think also with that, just wondering if by not doing it all those years ago, did I somehow miss something? Like, did I miss mm -hmm. my, my opening? Did I miss my opportunity? I've learned that that's not true, but there are times where unconsciously it's that thing that sticks in the back of my head. So a lot of it yeah. really is me <laughs> to answer your question. I 100% get that. I feel like so many times, and it doesn't even matter if this is, you know, talking about a journey on YouTube Whatever you decide to do professionally, personally, as a hobby, it's so easy for us to get in our own way, mm -hmm. right? It's And you said it. We tend to be our worst enemy and our loudest critic, mm -hmm. you know? And once you get into, once you start hearing that or allowing yourself to hear that, it's hard to push past. It, re it really is. To a point, if you use it as fuel, it could be healthy, right? Mm -hmm. Because yeah. us being our own critic, it's going to force us to try to do better, right? Where we right. push out better content, we push out better or higher quality, mm -hmm. things like that. So in, in a way, if used correctly, it can be an asset. However, great that we don't let it hinder us instead on the other side of the spectrum. Absolutely. Yeah. So I know you were able to attend the Sundance Film Festival this year. You were able to attend in person. So I was wondering if you can talk about your experience and how it actually was being there in person. So the whole Sundance experience, and it's crazy the way certain things are set up and the trajectory of something can happen long before you even realize it's going to happen. But I say that because back in 2021, I had the opportunity to, and I, I still cannot tell you how, I, I think I, I don't know, somehow I was looking around and I found that there was some kind of world premiere of a film called Passing and that they were showing it at a certain theater and it was a drive-in world premiere, of course, you know, everything was still going on, but basically we were able to be the first ones to see this film ever and, and what I now know to be the usual Sundance setup as far as the announcements, you know, what the information they share. They had this little podium in front of the um, drive-in screen and we were able to listen to what they were saying on the radio. And so I think that in and of itself was a really, not only unique experience, but timely because of, because one thing I didn't say is that 2020 was obviously for a lot of people a very trying time. And I think by the time we got to this experience, I, I was a little mentally and emotionally checked out. And even though I was doing YouTube and all that, I was still very much in a bit of a dark space as far as like, what will life look like going forward is, did I, and then of course, with those thoughts about waiting too late, it's like, we are in the midst of a global, you know, situation that doesn't seem to be going well. And there are other things, you know, as far as society and life. And so it's just like, I was, I was very much in a tailspin mentally. And so when this came along, it was something that kind of pulled me out of that. And what also, of course, didn't help, you know, no theaters, you know, <laughs> they were all, you know, locked down. So no one's going yeah. to the theaters. You can't go. And that was one of my go to 
places. It's like that's kind of like my place to decompress, to just enjoy. Whether the film is 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 great or not, sometimes just being in that environment for me, I find is just something that's restorative. So not having that uh, along with everything else was just not great. So getting the chance and the opportunity to see that film, not just in that way, but also in that way, it opened a lot of doors, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, at the time, I didn't see it, but I went and I did a review on that film. I talked about, like, oh, you know, this is Sundance, and I, I still have that video up now, and it ended up becoming my watched video, my most watched video <laughs> ever on the channel. Uh, and then I understood more about how film festivals work because when I saw it, it was before it got distribution or any of that. So it was there, that was kind of like my first, like, wow, this is how this can work. And then over uh, the next couple of years, I realized you could watch Sundance films online. So I watched some of them and I would give my reviews, uh, like films like, you know, Honk for Jesus, Save Your Soul and other films like that. And so there was, I came to a point where I was just like, I would love to be able to do this in person. I had mainly done this, you know, the drive-in and then virtually. And so I was just like, okay, I think, uh, I think it's, if it's possible, um, I would love to be able to go and see this in person. So I got together with my mom and we, you know, did some planning, did some arrangements, looked up the times, looked up, you know, flights, looked up all those things. And uh, I looked up tickets for the films I wanted to see, and we actually went to Salt Lake City, Utah. It's interesting the way it's set up. One thing I had to learn is that I assumed that Sundance uh, took place in one specific area, <laughs> uh, which is Park City, and that is not the case. There's Park City, and then there's downtown Salt Lake. That's something I will definitely keep in mind for the next time I go because the distance between the two <laughs> is kind of significant. So if you're paying for Ubers or taxis or anything like that, it's it's pricey. <laughs> so it adds up real quick. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say yeah that that I had to learn from that. But yeah, it was basically it was going um, to these different theaters. And with the tickets that I had gotten for the specific films, I got to hear from the actual directors, uh, hearing what their vision for a particular film was, and then seeing the film, and they're sometimes being, uh, Q no, not sometimes, I think it was always Q&As, except for one, I think there was one exception, which I was fine with, <laughs> considering what film it was, but most of the time we um, we had Q&As after, afterwards, and so it was kind of like this big kind of um, forum, almost. We got to understand uh, more about, fra through the Sundance lens, about more about how these films are made, um, what the vision is for it, and then what it is also f for our directors to, uh, showcase that to an audience. And I think it was uh, a really awesome experience. I even had the chance to, because I didn't think this was going to happen, but I actually uh, started Sundance on day one. I did a last minute uh, ticket to uh, a documentary about Frida Kahlo. And man, I couldn't have picked a better way to kick things off because I am a, not, I'm, I'm already a huge Frida Kahlo fan, but that documentary and the director and everything I just it, it set everything up perfectly so everything else I was able to see just kind of flowed from there I'm happy you was able to experience that I think as a film uh, critic or a movie reviewer I think that is a bucket list for a lot of us is to have the opportunity to go to um, a Sundance Film Festival or really to go to any film festival, which I know there are numerous film festivals across the world, across the states, but Sundance is typically the big one. That's the one everyone who watches movies at least a little bit can mm -hmm. kind of point out, hey, the Sundance Film Festival, or this is a Sundance Film Festival movie whatever the case may be. Kind of going along the same type of question, going through your reviews on your channel, you tend to gravitate or talk about foreign films, I think more often than not. Mm -hmm. So what is it about foreign films that really resonates with you? So I think I can credit part of this to my grandmother because, and this is my mother's mother I'm referring to. So she traveled all over the world um, long before I was born, of course. And so when I grew up, always going to her house, I could see all these artifacts in her house uh, from all these different countries, um, China, Japan, Spain. Uh, I mean, the list really goes on. And so I think even when I mentioned that piece about reading, uh, she was very intentional about 
giving me stories, children's books or otherwise. Uh, she was very intentional about giving me stories that were international. So, like, literally stories in folklore and mythology and any kind of tale from from all parts of the world. Africa, Japan, um, like, anywhere. And so I think already she had kind of given me that perspective of understanding that there is so much out there to see, <laughs> so much out there to experience, and that there's something so distinct and... Uh, impactful about experiencing another culture. So I think that once I had the experience of foreign film myself, I want to say the earliest in my mind, I could be wrong about this, but I feel like one of the earliest was Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Mm -hmm. And um, ironically, the first time I saw that film was at my... Uh, so my mother's mother is my nanny, and then my father's mother is Grammy. So ironically enough, um, when I saw Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, I saw it at my Grammy's house. And she was not someone who um, traveled the world like that. She was kind of the opposite. She was always in her community, but because she was such um, a light, you know, in her community, it's just like she was always kind of the hub uh, socially for the family, for the community. She loved to cook. She loved to have people over. So she was always um, bringing people, you know, to her, you know, to her home as kind of a refuge and a place of comfort and joy, happiness, all those things. So it's ironic now that I think about it that the first time I saw that film was there, and I know that represents something very different, but Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon was such a magical experience for me. And I won't say that I, because I, I think because I was still fairly young, I wasn't sure if I had gotten <laughs> everything. I'm like, I didn't know if I'm missing anything or understanding the way uh, flight and, and the fights and all those things worked, but I just knew visually, like it was something I never forgot. And then of course, revisiting and understanding more about uh, Wuxia and martial arts and just about what the film was saying and what its story was, was bringing across, uh, it just kind of captured me. And so the way I've been able to just kind of go from, you know, from, you know, Chinese films to Japanese to Spanish to French, I just find that with foreign film, you always get something that is distinctive and unique and sometimes it's just from it can be as simple as it just being shot or showcased in a particular city like this is France um, or this might be the countryside in France this might be Versailles uh, just being able to see it in that sense and then also understanding the styles and the ways some of these films are shot different types of cinematography different types of directing styles i've also learned that with a lot of foreign films i don't know if it's just the directors or the writing or i don't know what it is but they're not afraid to go there and really showcase certain things because <laughs> they are not they are not i just I, I i couldn't even tell you but i just so many different images pop in my head and i'm just like I, at least for me growing up, um, and I understand, not to say that there aren't R-rated films and all kinds of adult content, but even still, and some of the things I had seen, I just find that just with foreign directors, they're just not afraid to showcase a different perspective. And even beyond just, you know, mature content, I find that even as of late, I saw the film Kill. And I had mentioned in that review, it's an uh, Indian release uh, by uh, Nikhil Nagesh Bhatt, and I mentioned how in that film, there was this very unique portrayal of the antagonist. I'm used to seeing the more one-dimensional and must, you know, mustache twirling and <laughs> you know, very cheesy, very over the top. But these antagonists, for all their bad choices and questionable decision making, they actually had remorse. Once, once things escalated to a certain point, you actually saw there was actual emotional depth to these characters and they weren't just like you know you can get to a point with villainy where it becomes so cartoonish but that wasn't the case here and even with certain scenes where one character in particular recognizes who he is because of the influence his family has had on him he's just like y'all can't be upset about this now because this is your fault <laughs> like this is what you showed me <laughs> throughout life and this is where we are so don't tell me to slow down or you know stop or hold back because you never told me that before so we're going to continue on <laughs> with this and I found that much like the film RRR, which I absolutely loved, 
that film also showcased uh, male friendship and brotherhood in a way I don't usually see in a lot of films. So I just think that with just the foreign film experience for me, if you can get past the subtitles, that's another thing I feel like because I was a, a reader early on and because I discovered closed captioning early on, subtitles was never an issue for me. And I understand maybe for some people, um, it's beyond just the reading part. I think some people just are not don't have the fluidity of being able to keep up, but I hate to hear that because you miss out on so many unique stories. And I mean, I could honestly talk about that alone um, all day, but we, we can move on from there. <laughs> One thing I've, I find fascinating about foreign films is in a weird way, the simplicity of it. What I'm getting to is foreign films tend to capture the rawness of life. Yes. It's not necessarily beautified or, you know, romanticized in any mm -hmm. way. It's, this is life. This is the nitty gritty. This mm -hmm. is the beautiful. This is the, the tragedy mm -hmm. of life. And they tell real stories, in-depth stories. That's how I find foreign films more so. Whereas, you know, domestic films, I feel, are now, that's more of an escape, right? Escapism. Right. We are, we're trying to romanticize something, take your mind off of whatever the case may be. We're going to make it five times bigger, a hundred times bigger, a thousand times bigger, which is great. I think both types of films have their place. I really do. Just foreign films, I feel like, tell a more intimate, raw story more mm -hmm. times than not, at least in comparison to domestic films. I was also going to say, uh, you made me think of, because I'm, because I'm such a reader and I've, uh, sometimes I'll listen to audiobooks, but I also read f books physically. But um, I've read a lot about the history of Hollywood and the motion mm -hmm. picture film industry and how, uh, you know, as certain historical events happen, and particularly, particularly world wars and the Great Depression and things like that, you had a lot of films that were catered towards happy endings sometimes because mm -hmm. people wanted, 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 needed something to escape from. People needed to see, yes. um, you know, something, you know, completely, at, you know, adverse to life and the current experiences but then there were other times where it was the opposite where you know we had these happy-go-lucky you know glamour and all these things people were like we don't care about this we're going through real issues so we want to see raw realistic stories we want to see something that reflects our reality so it's so interesting given how that's been such a recurring theme throughout Hollywood. Now, I don't know, the state of it now is something very, very different than those years. We're talking like, you know, the 30s and 40s and right. things like that. But it's still so interesting when you look at the landscape of film and how people react to it and what they see, what it should reflect to them and what it doesn't always reflect at the same time. So you were just on the Latino slant and during that interview, you spoke about the disparity between independent films versus mainstream films. Do you mind elaborating or giving a little more context about that? So part of this, I think, has come from my experience with Sundance and with some of the other film festivals I've been attending. I've had the chance to also attend the Atlanta Film Festival. I've checked out the Tribeca Film Festival. So I've been on a film festival run lately. And because a lot of these film festivals, especially Sundance specifically, because they are catered towards independent filmmaking and mm -hmm. independent directors and artists and just that's their general focus, I think I've had the opportunity to really understand more. Because I think I've learned a lot as I've gotten older. And so I think there was a point where I just thought film is film. <laughs> and so I didn't understand that, they, you know, there's a, dif there's a difference in how it's directed, how the cinematography is. Didn't even understand what independent versus mainstream really was. And so what I find is that with Hollywood and, and the mainstream, it just seems like with these, with these big studios and, and big names and big budgets, what I find is that a lot of those projects fall into the style over substance category or what gets prioritized in those films is not necessarily the storytelling. It's all, it's all, I don't know, it's all flash and, and mm -hmm. panache and all these other things, but the core, the nitty gritty, as you were saying before, that's not necessarily prioritized. So sometimes we get something that should 
be fun and exciting and entertaining and entertaining but then we're missing something underneath that like what am i walking yeah. away with what resonates with me on a deeper level and again i feel like i've always been this way but i think again as i've gotten older and i have a greater awareness of life and life experiences i need something that just connects to me and something i can just mm -hmm. grab on you know grab a hold of uh and sometimes I can also escape and enjoy, but sometimes I just, I need something that sticks with me. So I find that with independent filmmaking, and I'll actually give you another example of this with a film that probably would be considered a Hollywood film, but isn't really. If we think about the film Rocky that Sylvester Stallone directed, that was a struggle for him to make because of the fact that uh, his budget and the money and everything running low and what that experience was for him. Everyone knows Rocky now, but back then, like the process of making it was not, <laughs> it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't good. And, but what I find about that, and I, I can't remember when I saw Rocky for the first time, but you know, I'm a, I always gotta look up my, my facts, my information. I just love, you know, diving deeper. So I remember looking, and there's a, there's a very specific scene in Rocky where he and Adrian go to the ice rink. In the original scene, they were supposed to go when everyone was there. So like, you know, business hours, everyone's on the rink, and you know, they're having a good time, blah, 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 blah. Well, um, Sylvester Stallone couldn't afford <laughs> to have a bunch of extras and a bunch of people in that scene. And so I was just like, look, we're gonna have to do this when nobody's here. And I, I can't remember if he had to ask the person to like, I think maybe he, he could only do it at certain hours when everyone else was gone. And there were certain uh, parameters in place, but that's all he could afford. But ironically enough, although it's not what he wanted, that scene is more significant because he's taken Adrian to the ice rink and they're by themselves. And I believe the machine, I think the cleaning machine is on the ice, but it's something so intimate and beautiful about that scene, the way that it is. Um, and I think that, I don't know if there was a point about Rocky not having enough money and that's why he took her at that point of the day and he knew maybe knew somebody at the rink. I'd have to, I could be wrong about that. But there was something very, even though it wasn't intentional, it resonates with you in a certain way. And so what I realized that when you have less of a budget and that and, and money is tight, it makes you think creatively. Like how can we build these characters how can we tell this story and i find that with independent filmmaking that's what you get that's what you get a lot of the time now it may not click with you a certain way it may not be your cup of tea but more often than not you'll walk away feeling the vision or the voice of the director uh, and i find that with so many of these films like i said whether it's up there for me or on the lower end i find that a lot of these films are so um heartfelt and vivid and distinct and you just feel something <laughs> deeper uh watching them so to me that's a big part of what independent filmmaking is it's having a vision with limited resources but allowing that to be fueled to create something truly uh memorable and beautiful i agree and i don't think many people realize rocky is an independent film mm -hmm. i don't think people really realize that especially today because it's such a cornerstone in cinema history for you have movie buffs who swear up and down about movies and have rock in their top 10 who don't even know it's an independent film technically mm -hmm. right do you remember your first independent film so i would say i'm sure there's probably like if, I, if we're talking like timeline i'm sure there's an earlier one but i didn't realize it but i would say the earliest experience I had realizing like this is an independent film and this is so, the tone and the vibe of this is so not, <laughs> you know, mainstream or something I'm used to watching. I would say Little Miss Sunshine. Uh, Little Miss Sunshine, and I had the opportunity to see that when I used to work at the movie theater, which also was another piece of the puzzle as far as opening that door of film appreciation. I already watched films, but when you have the opportunity to just go for free anytime you want, that <laughs> that also changes things. So I had the chance to go see that with my mom, and my mom has, has really been, uh, especially in latter years, she has become my VIP guest <laughs> for movie screenings or movie uh 
any kind of movie showing or movie experience overall because I tend to be a solo movie goer. I don't mind going with friends, um, but it's just not something I really do. I prefer solo. It has to be a very specific or special person for me to kind of bring them into that space. With that, we've had some really great experiences together uh, seeing a lot of films. And I think with that, the only thing I knew about it was the poster. I just, they, it looks like they, the family was running after some van and there was a bunch of yellow and it just said Little Miss Sunshine. I thought I recognized, <laughs> you know, I recognized a couple of actors, but I was like, okay, we'll see what's going on here. And man, I am so glad I did that because Little Miss Sunshine is just such an offbeat, quirky, somewhat dark, you know, very bold film. Like it's, it, it doesn't, it doesn't tell, it doesn't tell, I mean, it's a relatable story, but it really is a story of dysfunction. <laughs> and this family who is just so strange and so odd, but the love that they have for each other, and especially the love that they have for the daughter in question and their desire to see her accomplish what she wants to accomplish is, is it's a real thing. And, uh, and even when we get to that last scene and she finally performs on stage, it was just like, Oh, this this is this is not what I thought it was gonna be. You think of a pageant and you think of Little Miss Sunshine and this is what this is gonna look like. And then she gets on stage and she does something that is not at all appropriate. So um so yeah, for me Little Miss Sunshine was just about um understanding how even stories that you're used to about families, about, you know, a girl who wants to win a pageant, about any of those those aspects, how you can take that and have this just this very, I don't know, this just this very uh, kooky off kilter way of, of showcasing that. But then I also realized that one of the very first films I ever watched gave me that same impression. I would, now, this wasn't an independent film, but The Addams Family. I love the, I still to this day love The Addams Family because I was like, I relate to this. My family's a little odd, <laughs> but we love each other and we're always going to be there for each other. And I, I don't think people realize with The Addams Family how much it really says about the dynamics of family, how Morticia, how, how Morticia and Gomez are as a love husband and wife like it's it's so interesting the layers to that but I was just saying like I realized also at this age there are so many things that connect to each other so to get to a point where I was able to see something like Little Miss Sunshine and all of its uh, odd quirkiness was something I appreciated and I realized it was just not something um, at all that I was used to so what would you say has been so far 2024, what has been your biggest surprise? I would say my biggest surprise has been the film Daughters. Uh, and that is directed by, uh, I believe it is Angela Patton. And I believe she co-directed co it um, with another director. But that is a film about, it's a documentary that I saw at Sundance. And it is about these young girls who have the opportunity to have a daddy daughter day, you know, daddy daughter dance experience um, at the prison? Let me be very honest with you. When I looked at the, the the synopsis, I was very worried because for me, I'm gonna be, I'm just have to be very frank. I am sometimes ill at ease with Hollywood and its choice of imagery when it comes to mm -hmm. the black community. Not all the time, but I'm very conscious of what films, what stories are told, what films are made, the times in which they're made, when they're released. Like I just, I, I've seen a lot and I'm just so that I'm not, it's not a conspiracy theory type situation. <laughs> It's me just kind of recognizing that some stories that should get pushed to the forefront don't, mm -hmm. and some that are questionable and should not are. So to me, when I hear a story about prison, you know, my antenna go up. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay. Um, so, I, so I read the synopsis. I'm like, this sounds interesting, but I don't think I'm going to watch it. Now, what ended up being to my benefit, and I may do it again, there is an option for Sundance for you to... Um, get all the tickets to the award winners. So what, you know, there are films you see while you're there, but they also have the virtual option after the fact. 
So there is also an option to go back and see, you know, films later on that you didn't get, didn't get to see there. And it's the films that the audience votes on, that the jury votes on, and all these different categories. So it just so happened for at least, I think it was audience favorite. I think it might have won a second time as well. But it won the audience favorite. So I had access to that film. And I'm like, well, as long as I'm, you know, paying for this, I want to watch it. <laughs> so, and I, oh, and I am so glad I did. Um, Daughters is just such a transcendent, such a layered, such a beautiful story because like I said, it, it, it worried me because I'm just like, how can you tell the story of these of these young girls, you know, reuni reuniting for a lot of them, reuniting with their fathers in, in these circumstances? But, and, you know, and I was just like, how do, you, how do you even suddenly just throw them in there and then all of a sudden everything is fine? And the film is very intentional about showing what that journey is for all of them, what it is for these young girls to look at their lives without their fathers being there, for the fathers to go through this life coaching, like therapy journey, because they were like, we're not just throwing you in here. You have things you need to learn. There are things you have to face. There are things you have to deal with. And we're going to talk about all of that. So when I realized that, I was like, oh, wait a minute. This is, this is, this is going a different direction. So it's about them having to understand what has shaped their lives and the decisions that have led them, you know, to prison, um, what it would mean for them to get out and what they have to learn because before they get out there are things they still have to like how do you keep yourself from going right back in this situation mm -hmm. after you get out and then there are things even that the mothers have to learn that they have done to contribute <laughs> you know to this dynamic some of them have been you know have done their best to help the situation and some of them have not and then even what the film says about the prison system on a you know on a systemic level about the things, the the policies that are put in place to further divide these families. Why do we have systems where there are no contact? Like there's no there's no touch, no physical anything. You look at them behind a screen and if the screen doesn't work, oh well. There was just so many layers to that film and something that I thought would have been, you know, maybe depressing and all that. And granted, I, there were tears, but there were, it was like, it was like there were tears of sadness, but then there was, there were tears of joy. There were moments even where you kind of laugh a little bit, but it really spoke to the reality of life. And then sometimes who had a happy ending after the fact and who didn't, you know? Mm -hmm. will, those, will those choices shape the rest of your life or can you actually change the circumstances of what you've experienced? So Daughters for me just blew me away. And I, as soon as it was over, I was like, ah! And actually today, um, they, I, I, I kid you not, um, I just shared it on my community uh, tab, but they Netflix acquired it and they just dropped the trailer for it today. So I was just like, oh. yes. And so I was just like, okay. So I, I, so sometimes I'll do my reviews ahead, ahead of time, but I like having the, the, you know, the footage to be able to splice in there. So sometimes I'll wait till it gets closer to whatever the time is. So now that there's an opportunity, I probably will be giving my review on that. But um, I say all that to say Daughters is my number one. Nice. And I, I like what you said, the reality of life. That tells the, that tells the story. That's what resonates. That's what draws us in and gets, allows us to feel connected to these individuals, you know? Mm -hmm. All right, so we're going to flip it now. You gave me your biggest surprise. What has been your biggest disappointment of 2024? Oh man, you've already ready. I feel like I feel like you already ready with that. <laughs> uh, listen, one thing I would definitely say about myself and that this journey has taught me is that I'm not afraid to have an unpopular opinion because that's just life. <laughs> that's just how it goes and it just it, it, you know, if that's how I feel, that's how I feel, but I have to be honest, Furiosa. Ooh, ooh that's a hot take. That yeah. is a hot take. Yeah. It is. Furiosa did not do it for me. And it's not even like I had super high expectations to begin with. Cause only, and I only say that because I feel like anytime, and I feel like anytime you have a sequel or a prequel, you have to kind of adjust your expectations anyway, because this is a completely different story. It's connected, but it's like trying to replicate what's been done before. Even if you are telling a story that came before, the story that comes after can be a challenge. But 
I just felt, and maybe it's just because Mad Max Fury Road was such a surprise to me, especially as someone who didn't have any experience with the franchise prior to that point. Mm. I know it's the franchise that made uh, Mel Gibson and brought him to the forefront, but I promise you, I did not know anything. And even what I thought, the only thing I, I really knew, and I didn't even know was had to do with Mad Max, I had um, someone I knew on YouTube who did like cosplay. I didn't even know what that was back then. But she did um, uh, kind of like this cool get re- like this cool um, video showing how she created a, I think I believe it's on entity costume mm-hmm. Tina Turner's character in uh, Thunderdome the third film and I had no idea where that was from but I was like oh this looks really really cool so like I said so with Fury Road I just even with the trailer I was like this looks interesting I don't know all I see is cars and sand and blood and fire but it looks fun I'll go see it. And I just think for me, because it really just kind of blew my mind, it really gave me an experience I was not prepared for. I would say just in theory, nothing would have really measured up to that. But I still try to be fair and adjust expectations. And I just think for me, Furiosa aesthetically like has a lot of the same things that made Fury Road great. But I just feel like the writing for me and the soul and the impact, the edge, it was not there for me. And mm. just, just like a lot of the the things that are supposed to be impactful or it hit you a certain way, I just didn't really feel anything. And that's kind of the difficult part of it. And, you know, it doesn't always have to be that way. But I just felt like I would be more like, yes, yes, very awesome. I'm excited. And about halfway through, I was like, oh, I think it's a wash. Not a wash. Not a wash. Would you consider yourself a fan of Anya Taylor-Joy, though? Or are you somewhat indifferent with her and her portrayal? So I enjoy Anya Taylor-Joy. I I think, I want to say the first, you know what? Even though I didn't watch it, because Lord, that trailer had my head spinning. But I remember she was in The Witch. Um, But I I didn't watch her officially until um, uh, Split, uh, the M. Night Shyamalan. Yes. And yes. that's when I was like, oh, that's when I kind of, that was my first real, like, okay, this is who this is. And then, you know, I saw um, Last Night in Soho, enjoyed that. You know, mm-hmm. she did the Queen's Gambit. She's done a lot um, since then. So it's not so much about me not being a fan of hers, because I think she's very, very talented. But I also feel like because she's such a hot commodity, she was mm-hmm. kind of an easy choice for the role where I feel like somebody like Jodie Comer or someone who's maybe Ooh. not quite as visible could have sunk deeper into the role. It just it was some, and then not even just her, but I just think there was something about the characterization in the way they showed the journey of Furiosa to become, you know, who she becomes. It just was missing something for me. And so that's, that's kind of where the disconnect was. Like part of it was miscasting, but I think there were also bigger issues for me um, structurally and with the foundation of the story. What's something that you are either currently watching right now that has you really excited or you've watched relatively recently mm. that you were super pumped or excited about? Yes. If the video I did is any indication, Interview with the Vampire Season 2. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh, because let me tell you, um, Interview with a Vampire, the film from, I believe, 1994, that that film was already near and dear to my heart because that was my first introduction to horror in that way. And then definitely my introduction, along with Vampire in Brooklyn, my introduction to vampires. And ever since then, I was kind of obsessed. Now, of course, as we've gone on, we've seen different films. I don't have to say which one, but we've seen all kinds of different alternative takes on vampires. Some are great, Mm -hmm. some are not. I don't have to say any names, like I said. (laughs) But... uh, Very nice of you. Very nice of you. Yes, yes. Let's just... I'm just gonna... Yeah. Um, but I think that because of that, I always have a special love for Interview with the Vampire. And when I heard they were doing a series, and I knew this was something that had been discussed for years. It was something that was kind of in development hell, where it was just like they were trying to do more films, or like, well, what if we do a series? And I just kept hearing about it, and I was just like, I want this to happen, because I think the Vampire Chronicles, I don't know, it's just such an interesting take on vampires, and with mm-hmm. Anne Rice's, you know, 
book series. You know, we have all this, you know, we have all of this foundation to pull from. You know, I was excited but anxious when I saw the, uh, the um, you know, very anxious when I saw the first trailer. I, I, you know, I enjoyed Jacob Anderson because of his role on Game of Thrones. I wasn't familiar with Sam Reed. I wasn't familiar with Bailey Bass. I was like, okay, let's, let's just see. I was iffy because, you know, we're changing the time frame. Um, I, I didn't have an issue with it being a black character, but I know how the response to those things can go. And I think in general, when it comes to people who are very, um, who have really identified with a certain book series and you see the images in your mind, it's like, this is what this should look like. And when it's completely different, it's like, oh Lord, everybody's about to act a fool. And this is going to be like, this is going to be a bad situation. So I have my own reservations going in. And I watched that first episode. I remember it was like late at night and I was just like, oh. <laughs> I just, I was, I, was, I was like speechless after that. I was just like, I, I don't know what I would have thought of that first episode, but it, mm-hmm. I mean, it's been a while since I think a series from like the first episode is completely like caught me off guard like that. Really? It was just, yes. It, 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 <laughs> it caught me unawares. And like I said, I think it all, what also adds to it is knowing, you know, having that association with the original uh, adaptation. So it was just like just seeing this new take, new in theory take, but also incorporating things in the book that even the last film didn't. It was like it was just such a new, um, such a new unexpected uh, thing to experience. And then season two, because they had to recast because Bailey Bass ended up, you know, she was a part of Avatar. So I was just like, oh no, because one thing I can't stand is continuity breaks. So yep. it's like, no one likes recast because like it always sucks. It never goes well. Shout out to the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. I think we all know who the original Aunt Viv is. <laughs> it's, just like, it's just like, it's it's never good. It's just like, the, you can't beat the original. However, I will definitely give it up to Delaney Hales because she blew Claudia out the water. And I think in a way it almost works as this younger, uh, more naive version of Claudia. And then Mm. this older, you know, self-aware, embittered, resentful. Like you see kind of these two sides of the, yes, it's two different actresses, but it's almost like they, it still makes, it's, you're able to represent two, um, parts of this character are two different parts of their lives. So it's something that yes. really works. And uh, I just think the storytelling was just was magnificent, in my opinion, because it, it brought layers to these characters that we already know. And so mm-hmm. even how it plays with with memory and the thing and storytelling and uh, what is it called? What is it? The uh, unreliable narrator. How like, oh, mm-hmm. we, we think this is the story we're being told. And then there's a whole nother story that that's underneath this. And just the brutality, the it, there's so much that that worked for it. It worked um, for me watching that. And that finale just took it somewhere else. So and the fact that they are paving the way for the immortal universe and we are seeing all this like coming for I'm like it feels good genuinely to be excited for a series because I've seen some struggle TV shows and it's just it it's nice to be on the other side of the spectrum and that's all I'm going to say. Right on. So Interview with the Vampire season 2 just wrapped up. Now is that supposed to be the complete story for the Interview with the Vampire piece or are they going to do more seasons with that? So technically this is this is the end of Interview with the Vampire. But what Mm -hmm. they're doing next is the Vampire Lestat, which is going to be Uh, um, Lestat's journey and his experience, mm -hmm. which I'm already kind of familiar with to an extent. So I believe they're still going to find a way to still incorporate those characters that we've seen before, Mm -hmm. but they have to start from the beginning with Lestat. And they may do this thing where they kind of go back and forth and we see the present. Kind of depends on how they choose to, you know, write it and put it together, but... Yeah, we're going to get the vampire list died. I'm pretty sure that's going to lead, you know, to more down the road. So I'm excited. So with that, I know you have immense love for the original film. You now have what I think is a more fleshed out, like a mini series of the mm-hmm. same story. And I know you love that as well. But which one do you think did it better? Honestly, <laughs> that's a hard one. That that's has to be a hard question. Of course, of course. But it's okay. I, I, can, I can take the challenge. So... I honestly, if I'm just thinking about the entire vision, as much as I love the original, I just think what Interview with the Vampire, the series did with it was impeccable. 
honestly. And I say that because, and I think more so because we see how a lot of these IPs get dredged up <laughs> out of, you know, yesteryear. And then they throw it up there just to have something for people to watch. Like, you know, I, I, I didn't watch Willow, but I heard from a lot of people that Willow was a bit of a mess. I've heard, um, you know, really unfortunate things about the Star Wars series. And um, I just think we see a lot of films and TV shows that where it's just like, hey, let's let's make a couple of bucks. And it's just like, you can't do that. Like, either you continue the story because you can and you can think of a, a really mindful and considerate way to do that or just leave it alone. And unfortunately, because yeah. Hollywood is going to Hollywood, we get a lot of things that are just recycled over and over again. And it's just like, I get that. I get that it's easy to go for um, the low-hanging fruit, <laughs> uh, if you will. But I just think that there, there are too many creative things people out here too many great writers too many great directors in the making just haven't been discovered yet too many great stories and books i can tell you because I, I read a whole bunch of them there are so many things that um are ready to be put out there and i just think if hollywood would only recognize that and just and just and even if you are going to redo something, remake something, add on to something, like think about why you're doing it. And if there's not a real foundation, a real like, this is how we can do this, then I would say just leave it alone. And I think with Interview with the Vampire, whereas there was probably the slightest bit, uh, well, not slightest, a significant bit of, you know, of reservation and hesitation and so much more about how this could be, you can see where this was done to really explore what what does Louis Dupont de Lac represent in this story? What does Lestat de Lioncourt represent? What does Claudia like? What do these characters represent? How can we um, provide provide real depth to them? How can we showcase this idea of what being a vampire is and the tragedy of what being a vampire is in this very new way and not pull any punches, you know, about it and not be limited. Uh, I don't know, in whatever way people might think that should look like. Um, and not necessarily also worry about the book fans. I understand um, in some ways that's not a good thing, but I think when you do this in this way, I think it doesn't matter. Because I've always been a person where I can appreciate and look at it as an alternative version. Nothing's going to erase the original film. I can always have that experience. But if you do it well enough... I can appreciate these two different, you know, takes and perspectives and adaptations of the story, and they can just coexist uh, alongside each other. No, 100%. I like the way you put that. Mm -hmm. What is a film or TV show that you feel like anybody or everybody should watch? I think the one that is going to fly under the radar, unfortunately, and has flown under the radar, but I have watched and absolutely loved is Bad Sisters. That is the story of, um, I do believe it's five sisters, um, and it takes place in Ireland. And it opens up with a very unexpected death in the family. However, as you go along, there are questions about how this person really died, <laughs> who may be involved, who is trying to figure out why this person died and who was res might be responsible. And then as we go kind of go back and forth, we this story of how this person may have died and their relationship with all of these sisters, how that, you know, basically uh, forms the entire story. And it was wild i think when i watched i think when i watched initially i was I, so what happens with me is that sometimes not always but sometimes when i watch the first episode of something or i watch the first 30 minutes of a film if it feels too much like it's pulling from something i've seen before there's a little bit of a disconnect it's just kind of like because i don't like um anything derivative i don't like anything that feels like oh no because i understand everything can't feel 100 percent new there are only so many stories to be told but I remember at first, I was like, uh, I don't know. But then I got to the end of the first episode. Then I got to the second. I was just like, oh, 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 is this what we're doing? And then I re and then it kept going. And I was just like, oh. <laughs> so again, it's just, I don't know what it is about the, about the gotcha moments. But usually mm -hmm. when that hits, that pulls me in. And so what you understand, I think beyond just, whatever this mysterious death is, each of the sisters have very uh, distinct and interesting lives. And the way that those lives um, conflict 
<laughs> with the lives of their sisters and how certain things occur um, is crazy. And um, how you may feel about the person who died um, at the beginning may be very different by the time you get to the end. You may be shocked. Really? So that was one. You said yeah. you had two. Um, this is the one that a lot of people will probably agree with. I know it's likely not for everyone. And it took me a minute to really delve into it because I was just like, I was worried that it was too... Um, I, I don't mind something that's abstract and experimental, but I worry sometimes if there's going to be a disconnect. But I also appreciate slow development and character building and all that. But sometimes, depending on what it is, I'm just like, I don't know. Is this worth the journey? I have to go with Severance. Severance shocked me. Like I really, you know, those, yes. Those first couple episodes, I was just like, because it it it's it this it's intentional with how it does this, but everything is so sterile and so desaturated, and every and everything much like a you know some of these corporate work environments, but it really reflects that in a very uh, specific way. And because it 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 is a very slow buildup, I was kind of like, and and like I said, let's be clear, I don't need a whole bunch of you know shenanigans, cliffhangers, explosions, you know, snappy dialogue, any of that. But it's so shrouded in mystery in the beginning, and it's so off putting and creepy that I was just like, mm, I don't know, I don't know, do I even want to know what's happening here? And I'm so glad I, I took the opportunity because it's just like there are these little pinpricks of things that you see and then by the time you get to the end and I find that having had the experience to watch this a second time, it just always feels good to like rewatch something. Realizing and seeing so many things that I didn't before was just like, huh, this is this is really brilliant. Like not to say that I didn't enjoy it before, but it's just like the way you can just put everything together yeah severance is great and i'm so ready I, I i don't i don't appreciate the fact that i have to wait until january but i know it's gonna be worth the wait so i'll deal with it really hey you are a movie reviewer you're a movie critic right so you have things that's on your in your schedule that i know you are excited to watch that you haven't seen yet. So what are you most anticipating to watch next? I am extremely excited uh, for Wicked, uh, part one. In yes. Um, and that is because I am, and I never would have thought this when I was younger, but um, I had some realization some years ago that uh, I love the theater. <laughs> I really <laughs> love the theater and I really love the stage. And I love musicals, not all of them, like there are some people who are probably real hardcore, diehard musical fans. I don't know if I'm that far gone, but there's something about um, seeing, having like the experience of seeing so many um, shows, whether it's a musical or just a play on stage. And uh, I, I just, I think it's something that I really appreciate. This is another thing that is linked to childhood, Chicago and everything else. But I remember my mother, my grandmother and I were walking around. This is a uh, nanny. My nanny, my mommy and I were walking around downtown Chicago. Um, we were outside, um, I believe it was the, I think it was the Fox Theater, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And so we saw like these limos pulling up, people walking out in these, you know, the suits and, you know, like, and so my grandmother was like, what's going on here? So she was like, you know, let's, she walked up, um, you know, I'm just, I'm, I was either probably had a book in my hand or was just like looking around, not really paying attention. She walked up to see what was going on, found out what was going on. She bought a ticket, and mind you, we're just wearing regular old clothes. We're not dressed up or anything. She's like, <laughs> okay, let's go see this. I didn't know what was going on, and so we go into um, the theater. We sit down. I see um, people on stage, and I see this man, you know, you know, like introducing something, talking about this something that's on an auction, and da 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 da. I'm confused. Um, trying to figure out what's going on still. All of a sudden, there's this massive explosion. These lights explode. And all of a sudden, this chandelier starts floating off the stage into the top, you know, of the theater. Then I come to find out we're watching The Phantom of the Opera. <laughs> From that day on, and like I said, it took time. I'm not saying all of a sudden I was on board. But I think, mm -hmm. considering that a lot of us start off with Sesame Street, Barney, Mr. Rogers' mm -hmm. Neighborhood, and then Disney films, you know, non-Disney films that have music as well. 
I just think it was always there. My mom then kind of got, you know, I had Mary Poppins and then Sound of Music. I had little things here and there, but it took time before I could really appreciate it on a large scale. And Chicago was a big part uh, of that, but it still took time as well. So I just think now, especially having had the opportunity after lockdown and all that to return to the theater and see The Wiz, Tina, Michael Jackson, and recently um, The Preacher's Wife on the stage. Mm -hmm. um, and then right before lockdown, I had seen Wicked for the first time. I just think um, seeing a big budget adaptation of that story um, it's just going to be wild. And I, I think because I have such a love and an enjoyment of that musical and what they've done with the story, because what the original, like the original story is dark. I mean, like oh. dark, capital D-A-R-K. <laughs> one, like, one of the first, like one of the earliest moments in the book is a certain character being born and then chewing off the finger of the person that help birth them so it, it it's yeah it's it's a very it doesn't pull any punches so the musical has elements of that darkness but it doesn't go that far so i'm just really excited to see like how they're going to take elements of the original novel mm -hmm. and aspects of the musical and then just seeing like those musical numbers and just certain aspects of it just play out um, in a visual, you know, this big visual uh, spectacle style. I, too, am also very excited to see Wicked. I love hearing you talk about you and your family and the significance your family has had with you and your love for theater and cinema. You brought up your nanny and your mom. Like, you brought them up numerous times throughout this conversation, and I could tell, like, that relationship you have with them. First off, I... I admire it. I love it. Mm. And the fact that that's such a integral part of your growth as a movie critic, movie reviewer, and who you are today. I, I just think that's amazing. I think that's beautiful. Uh, one thing I'll also say is that when it comes to my, I guess, my film criticism or my general commentary, I find, and it's something I think, I don't know if it was always there, um, or it's just something that I kind of recognized as I went along, but... I find that my commentary, not all the time, I try to balance it out a little bit, but I find that it is so personal because as I've said, like these films are tied to so many different people and places and faces and memories. And it can be very difficult um, to see them. And, and, and the thing is, I'm a very visual person mentally. And because I've, I still can remember so many of the things from when I was young, very specific core memories, people, and all of these things. I think a lot of times those things, unconsciously sometimes, sometimes consciously, sometimes unconsciously, are those things are swirling, swirling around in my brain. So with some of those films, because I know that this person was there the first time I watched this film, or um, we went to this theater the first time we saw this film. I remember, or sometimes, I hate to say it, sometimes with more tragic things, I know that there are certain films connected to that or certain images that remind me of certain people. So I think the thing is for me uh, is recognize, because there are some moments which I'm not ashamed of. Because honestly, when it comes to being emotional and expressing certain things, I don't have an issue with that if I'm, if I'm going to be frank. My only issue is just I don't like the way my <laughs> voice wobbles when I get emotional. Like, yeah, I'm like, yeah, I, mean, I don't care about actual emotion. It's just like, can I have a stable voice, please? Like, this is messing up my <laughs> my intonation, you know? Um, that's the only issue I have with it. But there are moments, um, you know, in videos where it reminds me of certain... Uh, it just, it reminds me of very specific people. And of course, some of those people are no longer here. So it's very easy... Uh, or and sometimes it's a sense of a sense of um, sometimes the emotion comes from the joy of that memory, um, you know, or how it can be bittersweet and so many things. Um, I remember and sometimes it can come from, from an unexpected place. Very recently, I saw Thelma, which I think is a film that is um, wonderful and unfortunately flying under the radar. But even though Thelma is a comedy and nothing about it is really sad, um, I found myself getting emotional because it makes me think of my own grandmothers 
their influence on my life and, you know, what it would be like to have some of these experiences with them at this stage, you know, in my mm. life. So, and then, of course, the impact of elders in my life. And so, in a sense, you know, what it's like to not have that anymore and then watch a film like that. So, you know, sometimes you come in, sometimes you come in with something and you don't realize and then sometimes nothing is there and then the film brings something out of you you didn't know, you know, was, you know, kind of somewhere else. So I just think I recognize now that because it's so personal, I think by giving voice to that, by um, mm. giving voice to those memories and experiences, I feel like it's a way to really honor those people and honor those experiences. And it also is cathartic in the way that it allows me to not bottle those things up, but to allow those things to um, be out there. And by and through storytelling, of course, which I learned at a very young age, um, those things live on and they go they go far beyond you. My man, that was beautiful. I want to ask you for the viewers that are watching, like where can people find you if they want to hear more of your insight, if they want to get more of D Movie Man? How can they find you? Hey everyone, this is D Movie Man, fellow cinephile, popcorn addict, and emerging film critic, coming to you with reliable recaps, reviews, and reactions. And if you have heard that tagline, or if you've not heard that tagline, that is the summation of what I do over on my channel. I love reviewing films. I love talking about movies, especially with a personal lens and from a personal perspective. I love reacting to the occasional trailer. I love recapping certain uh, TV series that I've enjoyed and have a fun time with. And uh, just overall, when it comes to my channel, it's just about um, taking the opportunity to grow um, in my appreciation of film, grow in my confidence as a commentator and an analyst and just building a, a community on this platform. I love supporting other people in this community and just connecting and just seeing the great conversations that can come forth out of that. So if you are down for that, please feel free to check me out on my YouTube channel. That is D Movie Man, capital D, period, space, M-O-V-I-E-M-A-N. You can also check me out on Twitter at D M O V I E M A N two. You can also check me out on Instagram at D Movie Man again, no caps, and the same on Letterbox. There you guys have it. That was D Movie Man. Please make sure to give this video a thumbs up if you like the conversation, and don't forget to subscribe for more conversations like this one coming up. We still got a great list of individuals coming up on schedule, and you're not gonna want to miss our conversations and hear what they have to say. Until then, I'll catch you guys next time where we get to talk about it. Peace.